In this video, we're going to look at two-dimensional Cartesian coordinate systems. Remember, a coordinate system is a measuring tool. Imagine a ruler in real life placed on the system that you're studying. To help with an example, let's show a video of me throwing a die. If I were to draw the trajectory that the die went, it might look something like this. It's sort of curved to the left and then up. Now, if I want to quantify that motion, I'm going to need two rulers to measure where it was, something along the left and right axis and the other up and down. When I say Cartesian, what that means is that the rulers are straight lines and orthogonal, which means they're perpendicular, which means they're at right angles, which means 90 degree angles. Let's go back to the video and see what that might look like. If I were to represent that on my schematic, it might look like this. I have a horizontal axis, which I've identified as the x-axis, with a positive x to the right. Vertically, I have a y-axis, and I've had the positive y up. With this axis, I can now quantify the motion. Here's a tabular representation. It was about a second, and I broke the seconds into 0.2 second increments. Along the x-axis, it started far away from the origin at about 25 centimeters, and ended up about 8. Now on the y-axis, it started closer to the origin, say at about 6. And then it ended up further away from the origin at about 19 centimeters. Note that this had a lot to do with where I placed the coordinate system. You get to make a choice of the origin location, and you get to make a choice of the positive direction for each axis. The axes can point at any direction, as long as the axes are orthogonal, perpendicular, at 90 degree angles. And while they can point in any direction, the whole idea is some choices make problems easier to solve. Let's just take a look at a problem with a couple different coordinate systems. Here I have a schematic of a ball rolling off a table. What I know is that it starts about 150 centimeters above the ground and it rolls across the table. At each increment in time, which is not exactly one second, a time unit, it advances 30 centimeters. In fact, it continues advancing 30 centimeters to the right, each unit of time, even as it's falling. When it starts to fall, the first time unit it falls 11 centimeters, then 43 centimeters, then 96 centimeters. So let's quantify this motion. So we need a coordinate system. My first coordinate system, I've decided to put the x-axis along the ground, with a positive x going to the right, and the origin of the x-axis to be at the location of the object at the first point in time. The y-axis, I have positive going up, and its origin is at the floor. I can deduce a tabular representation of the motion for each unit in time. At the first time unit, which I called zero, x is equal to zero, that's here, and y is at 150 centimeters. I know that it's above the floor. So one increment later, I know it's advanced 30 centimeters, so that's 30 centimeters in the positive x-axis, but the y hasn't changed. So at the next unit of time, that's here, 60 centimeters, y not changed. Next one, another 30 centimeters, so it's at now 90 centimeters from the origin, y has not changed. So now it starts to fall. Well, in the x-axis, it's still another 30 centimeters further, so it's at a positive 120 centimeters, but it has fallen 11 centimeters, so its y position is 11 centimeters less than what it was before. It falls 43 centimeters from that, so that's 150, 96, and then finally it falls 96 centimeters, and so it's at zero on the y-axis, but still another 30 centimeters further for a total of 180 centimeters to the right of the origin. Now don't get distracted that is it exactly at zero. I've drawn my ball with volume where in my table I'm representing it as a point. What I didn't tell you is that this whole thing is in an elevator that's moving up at a 10 centimeters for each time unit. And in this coordinate system is fixed relative to the ground. I've chosen positive y to be up, but the zero of the y-axis is at the location of where the ball starts. And the x-axis here is, is off to the right. It's at a location that's 250 centimeters from where the ball starts. 
and I've chosen positive x to the left. So what is a tabular representation of the motion now? Well, at the first time unit, x is at a positive 250 centimeters, because I knew it was 250 centimeters away from the origin and positive x is to the left. And the y is equal to zero. Now in the first increment, it travels 30 centimeters to the right, which means it's 30 centimeters closer to the origin, so now it's at 220 centimeters. And if you look at the, all of the x coordinates, it just advances 30 centimeters each time until eventually it's 70 centimeters away from the origin. What's happening in the y-axis? Well, in one increment, it hasn't moved relative to the table, but since the elevator has moved up 10 centimeters relative to my coordinate system, which is fixed relative to the ground, means the ball is also 10 centimeters up relative to the coordinate system. In time unit two, again, it hasn't moved relative to the elevator, but the elevator has moved up 10 centimeters. If you looked ahead, you saw I had uh, some typos, which I've now corrected. At the third time unit, the elevator's gone up another 10 centimeters, so it's at 30 relative to the fixed coordinate system. Now it starts to fall relative to the elevator. Now it falls 11 centimeters relative to the table, but the table itself has moved up 10 centimeters. So the net movement relative to the coordinate system is simply one lower. So it was 30 and now it's at 29. It now drops 43 centimeters relative to the table, but the table has moved up 10 centimeters. So 33 centimeters relative to the coordinate system in the room. And so it was at 29, now it goes below the zero of the y-axis and it's at negative four. Finally, it drops negative 96 relative to the table and the elevator, which is a 86 centimeters change relative to the coordinate system. And so it is now at negative 90 centimeters as measured by the coordinate system fixed relative to the ground. So we can see the results that you have depends on your origin, your choice of positive direction, so you always have to make those decisions consciously. And you can have different coordinate systems moving relative to each other. Let's look at another very important example. Here I have a ball that's rolling down an incline. A lot of times when we have inclines like this, We'd like our coordinate system to have an axis parallel and perpendicular to the incline itself and not the ground like we had before. The reason is the motion of the object is constrained in one dimension along the incline, so we'd like one of our axes pointing that direction. So for this coordinate system, I have a positive x that's down the incline, parallel to the incline, and a positive y that's perpendicular to the incline, pointing away from it. Often we're given information like the incline is an angle theta relative to the horizontal. I'm now going to introduce you to a trick that's really important when you look at problems like this. When I have a problem like this, I draw two sets of perpendicular axes. On my blank scratch paper, I draw one set of axes that are parallel and perpendicular to the ground, and then I draw a new set of axes that are parallel and perpendicular to the wedge surface. That one is my positive y, and this one is my positive x. So I know where my axes are, and I have axes parallel and perpendicular to the ground. One thing I will now do is translate information from my picture to my schematic. See this angle right here is theta? Where is that theta on my diagram? Here's horizontal parallel to the ground. That's this one right here. And this is parallel to the surface of the wedge. That's this axis, which means that angle is theta. Now I want to introduce you to some geometry rules that you really want to memorize. If I have two sets of perpendicular axes that are rotated relative to each other by an angle theta, that means every other angle is also theta. So I now know all of those angles. Also important to note is that the other angle, which I call phi here, is also the same for all of the other four angles, and that angle is 90 minus theta. 
Now you can look at this closely and be able to convince yourself that this is true, but I don't want you rederiving this every time you do these types of problems. This is something that just should come naturally and just have memorized. This brings me to one final point. When you draw these pictures, they should be huge. One incredibly self-defeating thing I see students do over and over again is they draw little itty bitty pictures, almost like they're trying to set a record for how little space on the paper they can use to solve. Well, stop that. When you get large amounts of blank scratch paper, and when you draw a picture like that, get big axes. That way you can see everything, you can get lots of notation, and you can keep all of your angles straight. You can draw lots of lines on here, you can identify where your right angles are, and you can draw lots of things on it without getting confused. You're not here to save paper when you're doing these problems. You're here to solve physics problems quickly and correctly.